So um, I don't have any prizes in my pocket today, but um, I would offer something to the first question if I had something. And there's no pub in Binya, so I can't even buy a beer. So who's got a question they want to start off with? And um, we'll just ask that you use, wait for the microphone before you answer the, uh, ask your question. Thanks, Jeff. Now, where am I up to you? Got to get my question. Okay, Jody. <laughs> I've pre-warned Jody. Um, I'm from Out at Hay. My name is Sally, and I work for LLS Out at Hay. Um, always interested in the journey, your non-mulesing journey. Um, it's not an easy journey, um, and some of the landholders out our way have tried it, and. La Nina mucks things up, as you know. So once you get the fly wave happening, um, people start panicking a little bit, particularly when you've got remote areas and large mobs of sheep. So just wondering um, if you've got some advice for those. And the other issue we had also was there was a bit of um, uh, bias towards non mules sheep through the hay sale yards. Uh, obviously not for the weathers, but for the ewes. So just, yeah, if you've got any comments regarding that. Yeah, a bias away from them. Yes. Look, the first thing I would say is we've been non Just hold it. Hold it. Oh, sorry. We've been non meals for a long time. So, like, since 2006. So our sheep are completely different to... Um, the type of sheep that need to be mules. Sorry, Jody, could I just interrupt? Could you stand up while you're yep. answering, please? Yes. So, um, Andrew and I are not saying that all, shoot, all sheep should stop being mules because there are plenty of sheep that need to be mules. The difference is it's about breeding a sheep. As you make your way through that journey, it's about breeding a sheep that doesn't need to be mules because it's not just about the breach, which you can modify with the mulesing, but it's the whole rest of the body as well, which is where you say the impact from La Nina when you have these very wet summers. Um, you can modify the wrinkle on the breech, but you can't modify the pin wrinkle on the rest of the body. So it comes down to being the, the whole animal being ready to transition to that type of flock. So our sheep also have no pin wrinkle, like their bodies are completely smooth. So there's not, it's an overall genetic uh, it's, it's, a, it's the genetics of the whole animal and their skin type and the lack of wrinkle everywhere. And so that's the difference. So it's about moving towards the type of sheep that you're breeding to be able to make that transition, making really deliberate decisions about what you're breeding. So, and you can't just stop mulesing sheep that aren't genetically selected for those traits if they need to be, those sheep do indeed need to be mules. So that's the difference. So yes, we, we are well aware that there is um, pre people, who, people who don't want to buy, sheep, buy our sheep because they're not mules. But there are also lots of people that want to buy our sheep because they're not mules. So, and that's where we're, as, as people change in, they make different decisions with what they're doing and where they want to go with their own breeding objectives and their own flock management. So, but that's the message that we would give. It's about the whole animal. It's not just about modifying the breach. You have to have the rest of the body that is in line with the bear breach as well. Very good. Have we got any other questions coming? <clears throat> Otherwise, I've got to ask one. Um, I was just going to ask what ration you feed in the containment feedlot. Is that, like, are you fattening, are you using it for fattening lambs as well as um, maintenance? Yeah, well, yeah? we're using it for, we're, um, so we're finishing lambs in there, and so the ration is 80% barley, 20% um, lupins with a with a um, with a buffer in it, a buffer pellet in there. It's very and and with um, with straw available all the time. It's really simple. We don't even have fancy mixing equipment. We literally mix our ration by filling up the back of the semi trailer with grain and then lupins, and then put it in the silo, and then put it back in the truck, and that's how we mix it. And then it gets put from the silos back into the feed cart, and we go out to the, we fill the feeders out in the feed, with a, with a Bromar feed cart. It's still been very low capital input to the feedlot operation. Yep. Nothing fancy. Yep. yep. 
I've got a couple of questions for Alison, just while you guys warm up and get your questions ready. Um, you have to stand up when you answer the question. Sorry, Alison. Um, if you didn't go through the Farming Smarter program and you had those heavy rates of lime going out, what would have been the alternative management that would have been, how long would that lime have taken to go out on that on those paddocks? Or, yeah, what would have been the alternative? Uh, yeah, the Farming Smarter program definitely pushed it all closer together than we would have liked. Um, I think we probably would have gone for another year or two of continuous, uh, like of cropping, mm -hmm. um, putting a few more things in just to try and, again, suppress the, the ryegrass, but also then you're giving more chance to do a couple more um, incorporations. Um, in hindsight, we probably need to be doing a lot more monitoring. So we need to be doing, um, we need to, we now need to go back, and that's probably a priority for me in the next little while, go back and do some, another round of soil testing to see what the pH has done since. Um, and then we're probably, um, in the paddocks that we've got to go, we're obviously going to have more incorporation this time. So um, that will help. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, I, I still have questions around the soil test data. We had 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and kind of going back to what Jason was saying before, I don't think that's giving us the full picture of what's happening. I, I think we, that's kind of hidden the stratification that's happened in there, and I think we've actually made it worse. So I think it will take a couple of monitorings, a couple of tests now to be able to start tracking that properly through the profile. Um, yeah, so I, I, in long and short, I think we probably would have had a couple more years of cropping uh, and then put in, um, put in a pasture after that. Um, on some of the paddocks, one of the paddocks we have to sow this year to end the program, we're looking to put in chicory this year to being a perennial, we have to go with a perennial pasture. So we're going to put in a chicory with with some with some le, um, legume this year. If we didn't have to end the program this year, we probably would have gone another year or so of cropping first, a couple bit more, you know, spread the the the, the applications a bit more, and then put in probably um, not chicory in that paddock. But we're just trying to fit with the rules of the program um, and still have the best outcome possible. And we're hoping that if we put in the chicory now, it'll be a five-year program. Uh, it'll last for about five years. We can do a few more things, get on top of the ryegrass a bit more, being a broadleaf mix, and, um, and you know, then put it into something a bit more permanent. And we might even look at potentially a tropical pasture. So the, I'm, I'm pretty keen to diversify my base pasture mix. I want something that is going to perform at different times of year so that I've, I've, I've broadening my grazing, you know, my window uh, for grazing to minimise supplementary feeding. Um, and that's probably the best paddock suited to a tropical pasture on our place is what I'm thinking. Does that answer it? Yep. yep. As, I've got a second one. Sorry. Um, uh, the other one is, what would the carrying capacity be of that paddock before improvement? And what, what do you think it would be now, now that those paddocks have been pasture improved? So I haven't really... Ballpark. Being the first year that it's in, I've gone easy on it. I want it to set seed and, and get roots down for the year, first year. So it's, it won't reach full utilisation this year, and it definitely probably won't reach it next year. Um, I, I think it would easily double it from what it has been. Um, you know, it was it was a pasture that was had ryegrass and and silvergrass. Um, you know, the ryegrass you can keep going for a fair while. The silvergrass ends pretty quickly, just like barley grass. They're pretty short lived. So you know, you're only really looking at a couple of a few months of good production with that feed base and then you, you've got crap after that. Um, so this will extend it a good, you know, it'll double the length of it easily. And, and with the summer rainfall that we've get, been getting in the last couple of years, we've, we've deliberately got, in the Coxfoot, we've deliberately chosen a summer active one. So, you know, it will respond to rain if we keep it in good nick um, and, and look after it.
question for Richard Hayes, and it's a bit of insider trading, I guess, following on from Alison. Um, some years ago, uh, you put in a trial, tropical pastures, I think, Meriwagga or somewhere like that. Um, since we're out here, uh, have you got any comment about tropicals, potential tropical pastures for this part of, of the state? Yep, thanks, Mark. Um, and actually, we were talking about that over lunch. So, so yes, we, as part of the Tropical Grass Project, we ran a, a, an evaluation trial just to see what perennial pasture options you, you had. And we ran it at Gulgawi. Um, so a little bit drier than here, but, but in the ballpark. The key findings of that, so um, we tried to put in, I tried to think about all of the options that might be feasible. Um, so we had... We had a summer dormant coxfoot, we had uh, a phalaris, we had a mlucin, we even had a perennial velt grass, so they were the temperate sort of species, and then we included a range of tropical grasses. So, uh, short story was, uh, none of the temperates survived. This was sown in spring on about the only rainfall they got in spring in 2019, and so we, um, in fact, actually the, the temperates were sown in autumn, they got up and got going. The, the tropicals were sown in spring. Uh, and we managed to jag sort of periods where both got established. So that was a good thing. So, so the failures weren't due to an establishment failure. But over the sort of the next sort of three years, um, all of the temperates fell out. So all of them failed. They didn't persist. Um, and that was partly the environment. There was also the soil type, sort of a sandier sort of soil. Didn't hold a lot of moisture. And Gulgao is pretty hot and dry anyway. Um, of the tropicals that did survive, so I awarded gold medal to digit grass. So it was sort of the most consistent and sort of got better and better as time went on. Uh, silver medal uh, went to the panics, sort of Bambatsi panic. And then a very distant bronze medal was Rhodes grass. Rhodes grass sort of established well, uh, but then fell out as time went on. So I reckon. If you're into tropical grasses, your, your two options are digit grass and panics, and of the two, I'd lean towards the, the digit grass. And, and that was a pretty exciting finding for us because you don't have that many options out here, and particularly as you move sort of west of Griffith, you don't have that many options that can survive what we call normal conditions, or in fact, the extremes that you get out here. So, so the tropical grasses did prove to be a pretty valuable option then. Thanks, Mark. Um, this is to Richard and Carol. Um, you both alluded to some benefits to soils from mixed species or for having species mixtures, but what is the evidence for, say, multi species pastures having soil health benefits? Because this is one of the reasons they've been promoted. Um, yeah, thanks, Warwick. So, I mean, the, the key soil health benefit of mixtures is nitrogen, because that promotes growth. And, and it's not just plant growth, but any life in the soil needs a lot of nitrogen. And so the key soil health benefit is, is nitrogen and the effects of nitrogen, which is on in, increased growth. Um, beyond that, I think benefits are pretty minor and situation dependent. Uh, so. That, that's my answer. As an agronomist, it's all about nitrogen. Yeah, I agree. It's the nitrogen. And in terms of evidence coming out of a mixed annual fodder crop where there's a significant legume, we don't have that evidence to say what the legacy effect is. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to do that in a, another phase of this project. It originally was planned, but it sort of for various reasons didn't happen. Um, but some of those papers that Richard threw up or other papers from overseas make a lot of claims about soil health from from mixes, but they're often um, not from hard data. It's from like a review of a review paper sort of thing. So you just need to be really careful when you hear that it's going to make amazing differences to your health, soil health, just to be a bit aware of that. Um, question for Jody. Um, through in your presentation, you had a bit on the tools that you use and the, the groups that you've been a part of. 
Um, and I was just interested to know, like, the benefit of being in a broader farming network like the farm owners provide, how, like, did that allow you to sort of stick to the track you were, or keep you accountable to where you wanted to, to end up? It certainly, it was, a, it was an experience that highlighted to us the need for planning, for constantly analysing your business, understanding, um, the, measuring everything to do with your business, the need for planning. There's, you get an enormous amount of benefit from being able to discuss it in, in forums, whether you go to workshops like this or you become part of a group where you meet regularly. That can't be underestimated. And those are things like, um, I think even Alison said about getting, even just the, with the LLS funding, it kind of made you stick to it. You know, it, it gives you um, a, an accountability to stick to it. So those types of groups we did find really useful for giving you, putting structure in place to stick to regular meetings and media plan. And it makes you accountable. It makes you, you know, think, I really have to get that done. And it's a good thing. So sometimes we all do just need a bit of a, a reminder and a bit of, because it's easy to go, I'm too busy. I don't have time to do that. But that's the greatest benefit, I think, from these things. We all know what we need to do to run a sound business. We need to keep records, we need to understand the details of our business so that we can make really spontaneous decisions along the way and we can take op take, make the most of opportunities. Um, but in order to do that, you've got to be, you know, make sure you, you have a plan and write things down and you stick to it. So I think all of those things, but groups like this today where you get to talk to people um, can be just as valuable. But continuing to educate yourself all the time is, is, a, is a really great investment, that's for sure, yes. Yay, sorry. I'm going to ask the same questions I asked yesterday because I thought your answer was really good. And there's lots of young, budding agriculturalists in the room here. Um, given that you've had 12 years of uh, rapid expansion and running a fairly successful business, um, what would you be your top three for any of the young people in the room here that um, have dreams of getting on farm or you know, furthering their career? The number one thing, which I said yesterday, and I, absolutely, I reflected on this a little bit last night too, it's about, it's about take opportunities. As an opportunity comes your way, you, you might not, so you have to have your plan. That's the number one actually first. You have to have a plan and a goal that you hold yourself accountable to so that you're working towards achieving that. And then don't be afraid to take opportunities. You, sometimes opportunities, they might not look like they, you might not be able to clearly see how they align with getting to your end goal that you've got, but if it's an opportunity that seems like it, you think, yes, I can do that, take it. Don't ever say no to an opportunity. Just do it because you'd never know where it's going to lead. Um, and take all opportunities. And to that end, work hard. Yeah, don't be afraid to like, go, well, I just have to work really hard because it's true that the harder you, and I, I'm not saying work dumb, because you know, sometimes that is, it's plenty of, like doing the office work, being up to date with your records, keeping on top of everything. Work hard, know where your business is at, be able to take opportunities that come your way all the time. That's, that would be the number one thing, and have a plan. You have to always have a plan so that you know what you're working towards. Thanks. Martin Bruce, Local Land Services. Um, probably Richard or Carol, just a question for you. Um, and I'd love to have that slide up again. Carol, I think it was yours where you had the um, the mixed, uh, uh, like the day zero, day 25 and 31, I think it was, and you had those mixed um, pasture mixes of wheat, brassica, chicory, canola, whatever it was that you had there, and then you had the, the, the simpler mixes and you had the growth rates there that you were looking at, those rates. What I'm interested in is, and putting my livestock hat on, um, is palatability of pastures. You know, we talk about you know multi-species pastures, or do we go more for a simpler, you know, monoculture type scenario? But you throw sheep or you throw cattle into a paddock, whether it's this high or this high, whatever it's going to be. But they just because it's green doesn't necessarily mean they eat it. And and what I'm interested in about those mixed culture species of pastures, have you actually ever monitored as to which varieties eaten more than the other? You know. Because you do, you notice it when you watch, if you sit down you know, and watch them, they do. They, they selectively select pants. It's, um... Um, yeah, so there is um, a difference in the palatability if you, you need to adjust the animals to that, to those different mixes. So 
typically, well, I found if you put a pasture, sort of sheep into a paddock that's got brassica, they'll eat everything but the brassica first. But once they get a taste for it, they actually get really into it and then start gouging it for quite extensively. So there is an adjustment period, but often once they've had that adjustment period, then, then the next time they graze that paddock, they'll, they'll graze it more consistently. So there is a bit of a management factor in, in getting that right, and that's why um, also if you have a paddock that has too much brassica in it, once they do get a taste for it, they will really graze it down hard. And if they're not eating the other things, that's when you get some of those animal health implications. So there is a management adjustment to getting them to graze properly. And, and just thinking a little bit more broadly about it, because I think it's a really good point that you raised, but, but really that's actually one of the complexities of having the mixtures, and that's, that's a reason why, you know, you've got you've to have a reason to have a mixture before you take on that complexity, because it's, it's one thing, and maybe we overemphasise a little bit, it's one thing to get things up and going and established and growing, but then what happens once you start to impose your management on it? And you, you will graze whenever you graze, depending on what you do on your farm, but it's very hard to do it in such a way that it doesn't bias one way or the other. So in terms of maintaining that mixture, whatever that mixture is, it's very easy and it's very likely that grazing will actually sort of determine whether, you know, if you've got loosen and a grass, Either, either the loosen will domin dominate or the loosen will get grazed out and the grass will dominate and, and your management will sort of help direct where you go. So it, it is one of the big complexities of having mixtures and that's why you want to think carefully about what you want to achieve about your, from your mixture before you launch in and just sow it. Uh, I was just wanting to ask Jason about uh, the, the, the actual process of soil testing. Um, Probably a lot of producers uh, just get their rural reseller to do it, and especially on the cropping side, it's pretty expensive when you get this big, big report back. Um, and uh, so, is it something that we should be doing ourselves? And um, and where would you send it to get it those prices that you were talking about? Yep. So. Um Labs are accredited, so we have a, a, what's called an ASPAC accreditation, and to get that, the accreditation external entity sends um, samples to labs and don't tell them what they are. The labs test them, send them back, and they've got to be within a certain range to be accepted, and then they're ticked off as accredited labs. So you always look for that ASPAC accreditation. So uh, uh, CSPP, Apple, APL, um, uh, Nutrient Advantage, like IPL, they all have them, big labs have them. Um, how to save money on soil analysis is by just getting measured what you use. So uh, if you tick the box for all the things, $130 is what that will cost for a 0 to 10 centimetre sample or any, you know, a sample. And then, like, I, I play this game because that's how the circles I move in. It's like, right, here's your soil test result. Show me what I need to see in that. And they look at it and they go, yeah, well, your pH is this and your coal well's that. Maybe your aluminium's this. So they use three things, but they're paid for everything. And so when you wind it back and get coal well P, uh, exchangeable cations including aluminium uh, and pH, that, that costs about... $35, $40. If you throw in carbon as well, um, it's around $50. And so for depth, you can get all that information that you use for 200 bucks. Um, now, is that expensive? Not when you're going to go and make fertiliser decisions off it and liming decisions off it. Like, uh, that's a small amount of money in the grand scheme of things. The decisions you're about to make and put them in context of pasture establishment, that's a decision that's going to be made then for an existing pasture that's going to you know, be in the ground for quite some time. So does that, is that what you're after? Yep. So commercial agronomists, like you trust them, they're good people, mostly. No, no, they're good people. And, but, but just say, I don't, want to, I don't want everything. I want the stuff that we're going to, the levers that I'm going to pull as a manager. I need to know what, what they are. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Um, we're going to pull those question that Q and A session up there, and we're just going to give our speakers 
who gave us yesterday and today a little uh, gift for their time and their efforts. And um, if we could just thank them for to coming along and presenting for us. And Carol isn't missing out. We have already given hers, and she's on her way very shortly. <laughs> okay, thanks, guys.